Sunrise another day Wind blowing freely Spirits of the east I call to you Come and be near me Breathing through a tangled web All the knots are in your head In every single breath you said Come and be near me Welcome everybody to the very first episode of The Witch Wavelength my new video podcast from the treehouse and um, with me today is a very special first guest um, Imelda Alkvist and who is an international teacher of sacred art Seda is that right Imelda yeah, yeah. Seda, which is the ancestral wisdom teachings of, of northern Europe and author mother mystic and forest witch <laughs> and Imelda and I have actually met in person physically press the flesh um three years ago Imelda came to visit my tree house so um it's lovely to to see you again Imelda even though we are across the miles you're not that far away though are you in London yeah. I'm not that far away, and my husband was actually sailing his sailing boat very near where you are. So he was looking for that church where you do many of your beautiful recordings. And he called me to say, I can almost see Sheena Condi. I'm in her territories. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're very much alive, and we play your CD and music. You're very much alive uh, in our family and house as well. Oh, and same goes here, because you are very much alive in the treehouse. I've got your wonderful postcards with your yeah. art on that you gave me last time you visited. So they are they have been adorning the treehouse for the last three years. So it's, yeah, so it's wonderful, isn't it? We're keeping our, our, our witchery alive with each other. Um, yeah. And witchery is the first thing I want to, well, I want to focus on witchery the whole time, really. But, you know, there are aspects of, of your witchery that I want to talk about as well. Um, but I know that you really love to prefer, you prefer to call yourself the forest witch. So, um, so tell me about forest witchery and, and what it is and, and, and what you do as a forest witch. You know, what's, what's that? What does that mean to you? Uh, well, it kind of means everything to me. <laughs> but about five years ago, our family bought a house in Sweden and my husband is Swedish. So I was just kind of like going home and we lived in Sweden before we lived in the UK and I'm actually Dutch. So, uh, and our house is set in the forest in Sweden. So a whole chapter in my life opened up with finding deer bones in the forest and all these medicinal plants growing in the wild and, you know, feathers as well. And um, also like being on the land and there are no human beings. There's like our house and then you have about a kilometer, 900 yards, no, a bit more than 900 yards. In one direction, we have a neighbor, and then there's a horse farm, like a kilometer in the other direction, and the rest of it is just dense forest. So it's a place where I can be for days on end, not even meet another human being. And you know, there's lots of wildlife, so I wake up in the mornings and I've heard a deer standing outside my bedroom window, and you know, I have these conversations with the deer mother and all of it. So if you ask me about what is the location your soul calls home, well, that is it. And I'm in London right now because I still have. Um, some going to school here doing A levels, high school exams. So I still have to be in London. And also, at the moment, we can't even enter Sweden because of the pandemic. Nevertheless, our house is waiting and I can't wait to be back there. So, um, and before I started calling myself um, a forest witch, I was actually calling myself a shamanic practitioner most commonly because I, I had done a lot of shamanic training. Um, I have never actually like that term quite so much because it sounds like a practitioner is shamanic and I know it is done out of respect for people who call themselves real shamans in tribal and indigenous cultures I understand that completely but uh, I still you know it got to a point where I was very grateful for all the teachings I have achieved I had to see from my own teachers training in core shamanism but the cool to do what my ancestors did became very, very strong. So I needed to switch from core shamanism is more of a like a made up thing where Michael Harner collected various bits and pieces. And also he took quite a lot from other cultures. I'm not entirely sure what the permission status on that always was. So there is some question marks there about provenance, I think. 
Um, but also, when you really commit to doing this work, and at that point, I was also teaching my own students and all of it, you know, ultimately, I think people need to look at what our ancestral tradition is. And like, for me, that is Northern Europe, like, you know, being Dutch, but being to Scandinavia. Mm. So it got to the point where I wasn't comfortable with calling myself a shamanic practitioner anymore. That just didn't fit what I was doing anymore. And then also, of course, as you very well know, in Europe, we've had uh, witch homes and witch is still kind of like a, a tricky word that a lot of people still, you know, have a negative response to that. I'm at the moment teaching a series of classes called uh, Healing the Witch Wound, where I'm working with a circle of women also sort of unraveling all of these sort of projections and all of these, you know, wounds that live on in our personal and our ancestral field. So it just got to the point where I wanted to call myself a witch because that is a European word. It's not taken from other cultures. But then also there are like many, you know more about it than me, different kinds of witches. And for instance, I've never trained in Wicca or in any of those things. So if I'm going to be saying I'm a witch, then people may not have an idea of what I actually do. So also to sort of make it clear, there are many things that I'm not affiliated with. I decided to call myself what I actually do. And that is to be a forest witch. I'm happiest in the forage, forest, sorry, making my medicines and my apothecary work, working with animal spirits. And also I host my students there at the school there on my property where my students come and work in the forest as well. I hope that's a good enough explanation. Wow. <laughs> you just like <laughs> answered about three of my questions that I've got written down. <laughs> we'll go fast then. <laughs> um, yeah, the 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 um, I I totally resonate with that. I can understand that because I feel that pull to go back to my roots, you know, and mm. I think kind of that's where I am. I, I need to delve more into like the Celtic landscape, mm -hmm. you know, because that's that's where I'm from. Um, I'm very, I'm, I'm part Irish as well, so I, I feel very drawn to to being where I am, really, and and the land surrounding. Um, but you were talking about moving from feeling that you don't feel quite a shamanic practitioner anymore to being a witch, or which is what you've always been, isn't it? Let's face it; it's just the the identification with the word. Um, but do, yeah. do you see a shaman? Do you see there's a difference between a shaman and a witch, or what are the similarities? And what are your what's your feeling on those two words and what they mean? And what do you think? I think that's a, actually a very tricky question. There may be academics. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> sorry sorry about, about that. No, it's fine. We can have a go, but I think we almost end up in the realm. We could end up in the realm of academia, really, about all of that like word origins and what words mean. You know, and. Um, you know, what I would say there is that I think that um, a shaman and a witch essentially perform a similar function. Now, even the word shaman doesn't actually come from Europe. It comes from Siberia, where yeah. there used to be a Tonga tribe. Yeah. And then there were anthropologists who went to Siberia. And I believe it was the late 19th century, but it, it could be a few decades out. And they were studying these various cultures. And they actually then uh, took the word shaman and they put like ism behind it. So they created another word for a whole series of practices, which is essentially working in altered states of consciousness on behalf of your community, healing work, divination work, communication with ancestors, hosting ceremonies, and for keeping your tribe safe, you know, all of those kinds of things. And um, until today, that is the meaning that the word shaman has. And then, you know, of course, it gets really difficult because, because Western culture has taken that word. So that word is under the accusation of cultural appropriation. And there's huge debates about that in the world of shamanism. Some people say, well, the horse has long bolt with the stable. And other people say, no, 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 because they have more sensitive people to really look at this. But there's a bit of a move for food. That's part of that where we say, well, hang on. So if we have our own ancestral words, words from our own culture that we could use instead. So that's sort of inspired part of my own journey. And then if we, and also just to make it clear that those sort of tribal cultures, we often like speaking of tribal shamans, but those cultures themselves will have other words for that. So I'm banging on bracelet and my desk will take it off. <laughs> Otherwise, there is this uh, drumming sound. Um, so, for instance, like the Inuit people will speak of an anga cock, 
uh, the Sami people who speak of an Hawaii uh, in Latin American countries, it's Curandera or the Curandero uh, and so forth. You know, the list would stretch for many pages. So shaman has become a kind of like catch all word for a certain kind of work. And for me, it all just goes back to the ancestral tradition. For me, that is the old Norse tradition. And, you know, you already mentioned word Seder when you did your introduction. And the word shaman is in no way part of that tradition. And, you know, when these kinds of practices are referred to in the sources in my tradition, then what is used is the word, word witch, you know, a Seder witch or a Norse witch, or saying that the goddess Freya was the first witch and how she went out in the world and taught the magical arts of Seder to women and so forth. So that's how it kind of brings together. So I, I can I can really understand how you feel much more comfortable with wearing that kind of mantle now because it's something which is native to you, isn't it? It's native to where you your roots, where you've come from. Um, yeah. Because the last time we we talked, we kind of left it that you were going you were going home. You were going. I think you would maybe just bought the house in Sweden, and you'd got plans. I think so. 2016. You'd got yeah. plans to start your school, True North. And so how is that going, Imelda? I know it's a bit of a sour question because we've had like 18 Well, months. I mean... How's it going? How is that going? I have an incredibly wonderful group of people who are halfway for a two-year program in Sweden. Then obviously the pandemic came. So obviously Zoom is a great tool as it is right now. So I've been doing Zoom webinars with them and I've been setting them homework. I've also spoken to them saying I could maybe, if I try very hard, push for all the, the theory, the material on Zoom, but what they crave is being on that land, which is so wild. You know, we have wolves and lynxes in the forest and oh my it's God. almost become uncommon for people to be like in the, yeah, it's like the outback. So, you know, and it's by the Baltic Sea. So to be in a place that is still so wild and also messed with by human beings. So I've spoken to the students but like my feeling is what they love most is, you know, practicing Seder, but like being on the land and with these wonderful sort of, you know, local spirits. And we have rune stones, we have grave mounds, uh, we have a lot of rock art, petroglyphs, you know, like all, all of those amazing things. So the students were very clear. They said, we don't want to be fought off with, you know, you doing a whole module where we just sit on Zoom for five days and, and, and four nights. You know, we will wait however long it takes. And then when the norns weave it, we will all be back together on the land. So that's where, you know, discussed it with them about, I think it was 10 days ago, two weeks ago, and, and they all voted unanimously. They're going to wait until we can continue to work in Sweden. Wonderful. So that is how that is going. So I've got a whole school sitting there. It's like beautiful paintings on the wall, altar, oh. you know, all the magical tools. I'm going and to like, you know, they consider it you know, cut off. We can't go there. And so what kind of teaching are you doing? You, you've got your, your new online school, haven't you? Which I watched your yeah, webinar. I, I watched your Pregnant Hag webinar last night. Oh, thank you. Okay. Yeah, I loved it. Oh, I loved it. it. Do you know what? I It resonated so deeply with me because she, to me, she's the crone. You know, she's she's the crafty yeah. crone. Yeah. So I, and the bone mama. Yeah. I wrote a song um, a couple of years ago called Bone Mama. So I must I must sing that to you at some point. But it's like bone mother. I mean, it's the same thing, isn't it? So yeah, really enjoyed yeah. watching that. Yeah. That was a great, a great, a great introduction to to that vibration, you know, um, and and the spirit. So loved it. So what 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 else are you doing with the present hag? Well, let me just say that webinar you watched is free. I've made that so it's available yeah. for anyone who can come to that. Right. Like signing up, you have to sign up to enter it. But like you know, you can watch that free of charge, and that's also for people to see do they want me for a teacher or not. So just to sort of say that's a free resource. So what I'm doing on the pregnant head, I'm running uh, well other classes as well, like healing the witch wound. But I'm running monthly seder classes, and the most recent one was dedicated to the goddess Freya. And so I'm just continuing with the material where, you know, I delve something out. So there is like, you know, could be some rune material or it could be a particular deity. Or we did like a class on the norns and the concept of fate and changing the weave. And then so for two hours, we focus on that. 
And then also my hope is when I can teach in person again, that if people have a special interest in a topic they want to dig out somewhere, I can just direct them to the pregnant hair because it's all recorded and it all remains available for those people who have signed up and, and paid for the class. Yeah. So, uh, and it's really good just to have an online school. It's just a good place because, you know, it just, it organizes it all. So people can go and click and I don't need to be involved. It doesn't all run through my inbox. So it saves me a lot of time that people can help themselves. But anyway, I want to talk about your art because your art, as I said, adorns the treehouse. Um, and I've noticed on social media over the last sort of year, you've been painting a lot, haven't you? You've been doing, you've been painting prolifically. So um, how has that, how has the pandemic affected your, your sacred work? I know all of your work is sacred, but your artwork, I mean, I don't, no, but I do you feel more passionate about your art than anything else? Or what do you tell me? What I, what do you think? I, I don't think I feel more or less passionate with art. You know, I went to art school as an 18 year old in Amsterdam, so art will be in the main today. It always like you know, that's how I stay sane. Um, but then when the pandemic came and you know, lockdowns, you're not allowed to go anywhere. I think what I did, this switch I made, because people think I just paint all day long and do nothing else. That's not the case. I make, you know, I'm, I work from 8 30 in the morning until like 6 30 in the evening, and often I teach in the evening. So, um, but what I've learned to do is on the evenings I'm not teaching, is I really shut things down at 6 o'clock, 6 30 later, you know, do dinner with the family. And that time after that, because, you know, for a long time, we couldn't go out, you couldn't meet friends or go to concerts. So my evening time has become painting time. And I really, it like makes the whole day worthwhile. Even if I'm doing stupid, like, course-related admin, although that's the part I don't like, I know that at six o'clock I'm going to make the big switch. And then I just paint until I come to bed. So that's roughly between 7 and 11 every evening. And that's, and then, you know, you put it, I share the <clears throat> paintings on social media, but, the amazing thing that happened is that I think these lockdown paintings, maybe because of being locked in, they had an intensity where so many people got in touch and bought these paintings. I put them on Facebook, like a painting a day, as of nine in the morning, and usually by 11, I had a message from someone wanting to buy them. And it's got to the point that so much work was selling that we're sending the children to the post office. I couldn't carry it all in one load anymore. And I thought, well, you know, this is spectacular. That's never happened to me in a lifetime of being an artist. So there seems to be something about, I don't know, the subject matter or the deep dreaming that happens during lockdown that really spoke to people. So, yeah, it did take faith into another level. Well, it, it's wonderful that you, you've got that outlet of it, that sort of artistic expression. <laughs> That, that you can get that out because I feel for the people that haven't got that because it was an intensive time. It has been a deeply introspective um, time for everybody. Mm. We haven't been able to go out, so we we stayed in and we turn in. Now, you and I both know that for for us as witches and, and healers and, you know, spiritual teachers we have the tools to to deal with with these kind of challenges because otherwise what why else would you use them you know that these are spiritual what tools. would you be doing yeah yeah <laughs> but there are a lot of people that haven't got those tools aren't they and um i don't know i felt i don't know about you but do you feel that your your place as a teacher um and and as an and as a support sort of network for people has have you felt more purposeful in the pandemic perhaps um i don't know i actually felt extremely focused and purposeful before but you know my role as a teacher required was flying all over the world teaching in people in person in the us and in scandinavia spending a lot of time on airplanes getting to places to teach there and that all dropped away overnight so what I've observed in my class, and I don't know if I am more purposeful, but I think my students have become more purposeful. Because before the pandemic, in the US, like my art students would say, oh, but what's the group in Europe doing? And I would tell them, I say, you can find them on Facebook, Peter out. And then saying here in Europe, say, some people in the US are doing amazing things. Oh, how interesting. And I was like, give them the links. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it would peter out. Now, these people, that's why I teach in the evening. So it stretches, you know, it works for the people in the US as well. That's why I never teach in the morning. It doesn't work for the people who are asleep in the US. 
I now have my European students in the same class as my students in the US and they're interacting in real time. And they've started their own projects. They're doing their own like Zoom sessions and like they're doing stuff where I'm not even involved anymore. So there are all these bridges being built across the Atlantic and like they're in other locations as well. You know, like I've even had students on uh, research stages in Antarctica. So I felt I was truly working with all continents wow, now. That's so amazing. that was really fascinating. That's amazing. You get people in Australia or in Peru, you know. And can I ask, can I go a bit deeper into your into your art? Because um, you were saying in that webinar, in the Pregnant Hag webinar, that your, your sacred art is your portal. It's your portal to the other world, you know, and the presence of those greater powers, you know, and the, and the, and the spirit world. Um, so what... How, with with your creative process, how does your subject matter appear to you? How how does it start? How, what initiates it? Um, could be different things, but it very often originates in dreams. That whole series of paintings, oh. I mean, I have like a lockdown series. I called it that in the end. It was always like before I fell asleep in the evening in bed, all of these like hypnocognitic images when you move into the sleep state. Uh, I would start playing, so I'd watch it like a movie, and then I would pick out what I would like, and then I would paint that. So, like, what I was going to paint next was always like either in my actual dreams or it would be in the hypnocopic or hypnopompic states, and you're falling asleep or when you're waking up from sleep. And then also, but then when you start doing that, because earlier this year, like from the Christmas period over January this year, I'm still in deep lockdown. I actually started working the bone mother because you were just talking about your bone mother song and i taught um four day sacred arts retreat online dedicated to the bone mother so my students had done all of this amazing work but i was like hosting the event so as soon as it closed for the students i kind of plummeted down into the the cave of the bone mother but you know and also then there were you know the harvel room i talked about that in the webinar the indwelling spirit of rune harvel the pregnant egg I mean, she's the one I've named my school for. So I went to this really, really deep place where, you know, it was a dismemberment, because everything went to pieces, but there was also a rebirth that uh, occurred. So I made a whole series of paintings. And the next painting was always what happened next in that process. I spent about six weeks, uh, at least in my dream life, in the cave, the tomb, the womb of the bone mother. And about all of these things that happened there, and as I started painting it, I started seeing connections to, say, European fairy tales and myths. And I realized I was working for all of this. Well, call it mythical or archetypal, whatever word you want to use, like timeless material. And then eventually, you know, I had to be born out of there again. I couldn't stay there forever. So I painted that as well, what it was like to be born out of that place back into, you know, our world. But I've been kind of homesick for it ever since, because I sort of feel, you know, it was a time of such intensity. I'm being held by this ancient, by the bone mother, and have her sort of singing my bones back together after I've come to pieces. I mean, you will know that. You wrote this thing song about it. You know, it was just so extraordinary that uh, I kind of think that I have a day to be going there soon again. I have more time to spend there and more work to do there. Mm. Yeah, I must admit, last... I think it was Sawain. I really felt that pull from the earth to go into into the cave, and I've mm. I, haven't got her, I haven't got her in the treehouse. I've just moved her from the treehouse because she was getting a bit damp. But a friend of mine made me a beautiful spirit doll called Bear with Me, and she's got like a bear face, and I really felt that connection to the cave bear. You know, and so, and I still feel it's like you. I still, although I came out of the cave after winter, you know, sort of in the spring, I felt, oh, now, now, now's the time to come out. But I'm still feeling that sort of pull to go back in, and it's only July. <laughs> so I think we get that kind of, you know, we get that. We never actually leave once we've been, once we've made that connection with a an energy a spirit you know and, and we learn so much from that energy and let's face it we're both working you know heading towards cronehood now aren't we so yeah, we that's the way we're heading we're, we're heading yeah. deeper and deeper into that cave and yeah. bring it on is what i say i'm really looking forward to spending more time in the cave with bone mama 
<laughs> exactly. And also for me, that's connected to the whole concept of uh, being an elder, that I really want yeah. to embrace this sort of crown period and not obsess about, you know, my lost looks. I never had some looks to start with, but I mean, to really oh, sort of say, but what does it mean? But if I, you know, if I, if I get to stay alive, if I get, get to have, if you hold the people who died in the pandemic, if I'm going to have the privilege of like living beyond this point and living into the years where, well, we still have one, uh, one at secondary school, but yeah, at some point they'll all be like independent or at university. And, you know, I think that raises a very interesting question. Like, what does, what am I going to do with my life? I don't need to be a full-time mother anymore if I'm not tied to a London as a location anymore. Like, what does that mean? And then for me, the answer is back to the forest witch and also to eldering, to do the work of eldering yeah. our culture. And I would love to ask you how you see that, because I think you're on that same wavelength. Definitely. I, I'm feeling that that's probably why I'm writing a non-fiction book and a series planned in my head for to carry, continue that now, because I'm thinking about um, the next generation, you know. Mm. Um, so and I mean, I run a, a um, an online group for, for, for local witches in my area. Mm. And just in the last 18 months, Imelda, we've had like, you know, there's been a steady trickle of new members the whole time. It's been consistent. Wow. Yeah. Consistent. So I think, and I said this to, um, I had Channel 4 here a couple of weeks ago doing yeah. some filming in the treehouse. They were filming at Stonehenge. So they came here. Uh, long story, but I don't want to. I don't want to bark, bark on about it too much. But anyway, they came here, and um, one of the questions she sort of said to me was, um, "You know, what what do you feel that um, about you know people? What, what would be your advice of anyone that's that's wanting to you know embrace their their witchiness?" And I sort of said, "Well, you know, there's books. You've got first of all, you've got to." recognize how you learn because you know some people don't read some people don't read at all or some people will listen to audio books some people will watch you know they'll be more visual um so i think you've really got to be you know but yeah you've just got to get the message your message out haven't you in as the best way that you can and let's face it nowadays there is so much opportunity online to reach as you know, I mean, more so than me, Imelda, you're reaching globally. I mean, you've got somebody an in Antarctica, for God's sake. Apparently. You know? <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it? It's amazing. Yeah. Wonderful. Now, the book talking, is out there. talking of books, you have just independently published a children's book, haven't you? Yeah. Tell I have. The author copies aren't here yet. It's really annoying. And on Facebook, all these messages, look, the book is here, I'm reading it to my children, but my copies aren't here yet, so I haven't seen it uh, as an object yet. But it's out there, like you can see on social media. But, so uh, how yeah, did, I think you, how did you publish that, Imelda? Talk, tell me about the, how, how it came to be and how you published it and everything. How it came to be was, again, it's like the forest witch that, you know, ever since I was in my early 20s, 20s, and I then worked as an illustrator for a while. So, you know, I did some work for publishers, like illustrating, you know, like books for children or, you know, whatever, magazines. And ever since I've had that desire to write my own book, a like picture book for young children, it's very magical. You have all the portals in the landscape and all the animals and all of it. And that idea, you know, I, I tried a few times, but I was like, too busy with other things. So now during lockdown, and also not being able to travel to Sweden, I thought, okay, if I can't be in Sweden right now, what can I do? I said, well, I can now sort of write and illustrate my first children's book, which is set, of course, in, in Sweden. You know, it, like, it's all about that life in the forest and all the, the magical night sky and things that occur. So I thought, if I can't be in Sweden right now and have that on my doorstep, I can paint my way there. So that the story of that first book, The Green Bear, I actually wrote in Sweden last summer, then got busy teaching again, didn't have time to illustrate it. And then I, over Easter, I took a break from teaching and I was just painting every day for two weeks to get all of these illustrations done. And then I published it on Kindle uh, KDP. Brilliant. A Kindle Direct Publishing. Yeah. Yeah. How did you Which find is, that? Which is, you know... 
Um, well, it's another system you have to learn. And then on YouTube, people say, oh, you do it in five minutes. In reality, you start by filling in a U.S. tax um, form like you do also in, you know, you teach in the U.S. and stuff. So there is more to it than what people show you on YouTube. But the great thing about it is they print on demand. I mean, you will oh, know this because I know you have self books. But the beauty of that is it's not that like you have to invest 10,000 pounds in a oh. hope and then have your whole house full of boxes, hope it's going to sell. You know, they sort of print the book as the orders come in and send them out. So also meaning you don't take a financial risk and people still get it, which I think is a brilliant business idea. Mm -hmm. And also I, after publishing, I mean, I have three books published by Moon Books and the fourth one is coming next year. That's going through the pipeline at the moment. So having worked with a more traditional publisher for four of my uh, non-fiction books for adults, I really sort of felt that the Green Bear series, which really is Forest Witch stuff for children, uh, I thought I don't want to go through like a publisher who's going to have ideas about what's in and what's out and how it's illustrated. I thought, I, you know, this is my joy project. I want to keep this on my own management. And actually for that, it is brilliant. I mean, you know, that concept works perfectly. And also that means because, you know, um, you can turn it into a series. And I'm working on book number two. So now every evening, I'm teaching. Brilliant. At seven o'clock, I'm, I'm back in that forest and all these amazing kids are having amazing adventures. Oh, so you're, you're an indie author, or I think they call it a hybrid author now because you're trad. Oh, a hybrid. Okay. You're a hybrid. You're yeah. a hybrid for his witch. I'm a hybrid. You're, so a, you're hybrid. a hybrid as well. Yeah. But, oh, oh, that's brilliant. I'm going to get that book because um, I looked I looked at the description this morning and I thought, oh, that looks that looks amazing. That looks really good. But that's a really good segue into your other books. Um of which, obviously, I've I've read the Natural Born Shame in your first one. I think I reviewed it, yeah, and I, I loved it. it um, I haven't yeah, read. One. I haven't this read. One. Yeah, that's the book I've got. Yeah, um, and I've actually got your other two books on order. Okay. Oh wow! Thank you. So I ordered them this morning. So um, thank you for feeding my book addiction and. Um, so I'm looking forward to it. You know, so give us a brief, brief sort of um, rundown of those two books, two and three. What is it? The the Hollow the Bone, one. Sacred Art and the Hollow Bone, is it? That's this one. And Medicine this of is Imagination. Yeah. So yeah. what? Yeah. They look, one one, they yeah, look so amazing, Amelda. I mean, I looked in the look inside and they look, the table of contents is really intriguing, really intriguing. So, well, you know, thank you. So yeah. I think book book number two, as you said, you know, went to art school where you get, a, a, you know, as an 18 year old, so you get four years of training in mainstream art making, which was great because I really learned about anatomy and perspective and life drawing. And I think they don't do that anymore at art school today. So it's very lucky to be in that generation of people who still call the old fashioned training in drawing, but very, very useful, even when you draw fantasy uh, material. So... Um, and then also based on years of teaching, really, at some point discovering what I make is sacred art. Like, you know, I've never felt at home in the world of modern art or even contemporary art, but sacred art, like what you say about witches and people joining. I have people joining my sacred art classes all the time, people contacting me and writing in. So I thought there actually needs to be a book about sacred art, really about what it is to use spirit that process in art and what comes into play and if you work in that way it's like getting the ego out of the way and accepting that the ideas like come through us but they don't always originate with us it's like opening yourself to material that comes from the other world and from you know luminous beings spirit allies and ancestors and it's been so empowering because when i teach sacred art classes so many people say oh that's like a revelation because people get hung up on the sort of that modern art would be the only way of working. Of course, it's a completely valid way of working and a popular way of working, but it's not the only way of working. There's yeah. like another way of working. You know, it's, I mean, the human ego, when you learn techniques, which we have in my line of work, to get that out of the way, there's so much that opens up and people feel incredibly nourished by this deep connection to the world of spirit, ancestors, deities, and it just opens all of these doors. So, and I actually sent a copy of this book. I contacted my old art school in Amsterdam and said, would you like a copy for your library so your students can find it? Said, yeah, please send a signed copy. 
So that was just such a good feeling, like something coming yeah. in a circle to put a copy of the book in the post to Amsterdam. So that was great. Lovely. And then Medicine of the Imagination. Yeah. That was the book I hadn't really been to write. But that was after book number two, the manuscript, the final manuscript had just come to the publisher. So I thought, okay, I'm going to do some painting, take some months off from writing. And then the spirits just said, no, you're going to be writing a book called Medicine of the Imagination. I thought, like, what? You know, like, I'm not planning to do that. Um, but I asked them, like, why and what they meant by that. So I've got a whole series of instructions. And it's really a book of ideas. It sits on the sort of boundary between what we call shamanism and uh, psychology. It's sort of interweaves between the two. And it's really a book of big ideas. It sort of, you know, looks at, like, what evil is and what shadow is and, like, how we work with that in you know, ultimately positive ways. So really, it's an impassioned plea for fearless imagination. And the whole concept behind that book is that we, all human beings, have imagination. But we don't receive a lot of training in like how we use our imagination and what outcomes that creates. So what the book does, it takes a step back and it examines how the human imagination functions. But then also, unless we become more skilled in how we use our imagination, we will just keep on creating more of these outcomes that we've had before because we have ancestrally, ancestrally set patterns around the imagination. And also we've set a lot of energy in motion that unless we know how to cancel that and set a new direction, these things will keep on running. And that's why we see so much repetition in world defense, politics, climate choices, or even dysfunctional stuff running in families. Because people do not stop to really look at like, you know, to say, oh, I don't want that anymore, it's not enough. You're actually going to have to go in with skill and so heal it and unravel it. Yeah. And to just say, I don't want something, it's not enough. But the moment you throw it out, the thing, new thing that comes in is not necessarily going to be better. It might be worse. So you need to use your imagination and your spiritual skills then to work out what it actually is you want to have instead and how you're going to be operating on that level. So that's the kind of core concept of that, of that third book yeah yeah that and that's that sounds great because um i think that's where you know we 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 create our own blocks don't we and and it's i mean my work seems to be mostly certainly in the last sort of six months it seems to be working with people to to break down those barriers you know to dissolve the blocks that we put up mostly subconsciously um, you know, and people don't realise that actually they've got that power within themselves to change it. They can change their own mm -hmm. stories, can't they? We're, we're the authors of our own stories. We're the we're the artists of our own paintings. You know, as you know. So it's yeah. it's just that's where I feel my work is is my message is is getting stronger. I feel or just that I feel more focused. I think. Um, in delivering that message to people because that's what people need to to hear and need to understand it's about empowering people isn't it really um you don't actually it's tell very them much about empowering people yeah yeah, yeah. and also it's like made them be the author of whatever you need so you give them the tools and how to do them you don't tell them what to do yeah. that's for them to work yeah. out but also look we're all living through this pandemic. I mean, we're not going to go back to whatever we call normal. There can only be a new normal with all the shifts that have already occurred. So my impassioned plea is to say, okay, I mean, things have come to a full stop almost. This is the time. That's why I think this book was so timely and why the spirit has kind of forced me to write it you know, on, this, on the timeline it was on. It was published in October last year, you know, just in the middle of this pandemic. But I think this pandemic is a huge implication for all of us to really think about, okay, what do we all of us collectively want to create? And where, you know, what do we not want anymore? Like, where, you know, where do we need to do like shadow work and release things and heal things? And I just like hope that it's collectively going to swing that way. It will only swing that way if a lot of people operate from that level of awareness and what you just say, people become empowered and realize you can make different choices. You can live in a different way. There's nothing that says you have to keep on living an old script until you die. Yeah. Have you have you got another book in the in the pipeline? I think you're writing another book. Yeah, the book, aren't you? Yeah, at the moment I'm writing a book about the runes because you know another 
courses I teach is like when you're traveling for the magicians. So I mean, I have all these different things like about art students, theater students, which students, rune magician students are, are busy. So that's the book I'm writing at the moment. But the book that's uh, going through the system at Moon Books will be published sometime in 2022. It's about the pre-Christian spirituality of the Netherlands. And that was after several people from the Netherlands uh, started showing up in my Seder courses, both here in England and Scandinavia, saying, you know, this is all brilliant and that you know so much about like old Norse traditions. But they said, but you're like Dutch. Like, what about the pre-Christian spirituality of the Netherlands, like where you were born and grew up? And I would have pushed that away and said, yeah, I may look into it like one day. And then other students came and asked that question. So one summer, two years ago now, I think, I just, I'll just do a little bit of research. I'll just look into it. Because in truth, I thought I'm not going to find anything. In truth, I thought, you know, this being the Netherlands, very secular, I there is no material for such a book. Started doing the research, you know, reading Frisian and Dutch and German and some other languages. And, you know, it all blew up in my face. I thought, oh my goodness, under the surface of everyday Dutch life is this absolute treasure trove of ancestral wisdom and traditions. And, you know, I was sort of making all of these connections, like say, as a child in the Netherlands, we have the figure of St. Nicholas, St. Claus, who brings children presents on his birthday, the 5th of December. And now I discover that in the Netherlands, originally, he's the great psychopom, the soul conductor. Whoa, he comes what? at that time of year to collect the souls of dead people just before the winter solstice. And then you have, like, he's also somehow connected to the wild hunt where, you know, the supernatural forces sweep the land and gather up all the little souls, the souls between the worlds and yeah. clear the airway. So in a new year, you can have new, new beginnings and a new start. And I thought, like, you know, in Holland, of course, he's portrayed as this kind old man with a beard who brings all the presents for children. But I had no idea that he is the big psychopomp of the Netherlands and that he was plugged into all of that, like, wild hunt and all course material. So it's, and there were loads of other things as well. I mean, it's a huge topic. I will not go into more detail, but it kind of, like, I actually cried a number of times when I was working on that book where I thought, like, what have we done, we Dutch people, what have we done that we have all of this ancestral wisdom and we have discarded it and we're not aware of it. And then also I've written that book in English because a lot of people, um, I wanted to be accessible and it was a come under criticism for that in the Netherlands because they have an idiot, you know, a Dutch person writing about Dutch material in English. But the thing is that there are so many people who have like ancestors, you know, they have Dutch ancestry or Northern European ancestry, and they're like desperate to know more and do that work where we started today, you and I, about like what is my ancestral material? What did my ancestors actually practice and believe? So, and Dutch people generally speak extremely good English. English is almost like the unofficial second language of the Netherlands. So, anyone under the age of, you know, 80 in the Netherlands speaks. Good English. So I've written that book in English so that people from, you know, or people who have a more tangential connection to the Netherlands can read it as well. If I write that book in Dutch, also these Dutch people already, if they wanted to, could have access to these sources. I've also done a lot of translation to make it available to people who say, I actually want to know what goes on there. And even, yeah, well, you know him, you know, Trevor, the editor in chief at Moon Books at the imprint, I know that you know him. Uh, he was sort of saying that you have actually mapped what is kind of like a, a blank spot on the map. Because, of course, you know, he knows what books get published and lots of that Celtic material, Scandinavian material, like further south, all of it and all of it. But he says, you're right, it's almost like a kind of black hole that hovers over like the Netherlands and mm -hmm. kind of north in Germany almost. And he said, you have just like mapped that. And he said, you know, the books you've written, that because he was the editor for that book. So he and I worked closely on the edits. And he said that, you know, this is the most interesting book you've written, because he said, I found it so interesting on a personal level. I learned a lot of things that I've never read in another book by another author. I thought, thank you, Trevor. That's a big compliment, isn't it? Yeah. So Excellent. that's book number oh, that's four, good. and it's tight. Coming out. It's coming out with Moon Books next year. That's coming out, yeah. There's no date of publication okay. yet, but sometime next year, around this time next year. I think. Okay. Yeah. Oh, there's lots to look forward to. And um, so yeah. that's all your books talked about. That's all your courses talked about. Um, so where can people find you, Imelda? Where, where, where are you 
contactable online? Uh, well, I have a website. Oh, that's become an old technology, but I have a website. If people type in my name, I'm sure you put it in like the notes for the video. People just type in my name. What will come up is my website, my online school. We talked about it, Pregnant Hack Teachings, hosted by Teachable. And also, I try to have a presence on social media because as an author and artist, you need to. Oh, wow. That's amazing. Hello. I meant to show you this earlier. I ha that is a hagstone and a half, isn't it? Isn't it amazing? Wow, that's a multiple, multi-portal, multi-dimensional hex yes, stone. Exactly. Exactly. Yes, yes, it's amazing. Wow, Ian found, yeah. Ian found that at work. He works at the local marina. He's a boatyard manager. Oh, so he wow. found that yeah. just on the on the riverbank. Who knew? Wow. But anyway, wow, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. <laughs> I interrupted you there. But, no, um, that is okay. So, yeah, but so... Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm on social media under my own name. I don't have a pseudonym, so it's not Forest Witch or something. It's just Imelda Alquist. So I try to be active. At the moment, I'm trying to do Instagram for the first time in my life. But, you know, I'm pretty good on Facebook. I do some Twitter. I do Instagram. Occasionally, like LinkedIn. And I have my own YouTube channel. And I'm going to be interviewing you on September 7th, where I get to ask some questions. <laughs> and, oh, I'm looking forward you know, to that. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, I'm really looking forward so, to that. So, how are you able to, you know, keep it Yeah, tell me about your 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 interview, your podcast. Is it a video podcast or an audio? What and how long yeah. have you been doing it? it well, <clears throat> that's slightly sorry <clears throat> complicated because 15 months ago I started the project called Healing Wise, which is spiritual outreach work for children who are suffering, who we cannot reach, you know, pandemic in like everyday um, situations. And that like a dedicated Facebook group actually started on Sounds through the big spiritual publisher in the US, but then I have moved it away from there, gave it a dedicated Facebook group, it still exists. So I did a year of interviews where I was trying to give people a toolkit of how do you do spiritual outreach work with children and people you cannot physically reach. Also, all the consent issues and all the sort of, you know, the ethical considerations around that, obviously. So I did a whole year of interviews, but I only put it on that Facebook group. And um, then at some point I thought, like, you know, it would be better to start making videos that a larger audience can access. So I recently switched it on two or three months ago that now I still put these videos I do on the Healing Wise group and I try to keep my focus on children at least some of the time. But I've now switched to um, a podcast called um, The Pregnant Hack podcast on YouTube just to sort of make material, I think what would be life-saving material a lot of the time or like dialogues that really help people make it available to a larger audience. So I've been interviewing for 15 months, but my YouTube podcast is still in its infancy it's just starting yeah oh that's so it won't be my first you'll be my as it looks now my fifth or sixth guest on that still quite early on okay I, i'm looking forward to it i'm looking forward to it already great 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 and i'm looking forward to getting your books courtesy of amazon they'll be delivering them in the next few days <laughs> so i'm okay happy. I'm looking forward to getting my teeth into them and I'll um, I'll be sure to leave a review. Anybody else that's watching that's got any of Imelda's books or is thinking about getting them, please, you know, us authors really do appreciate a review. All you need to do is a couple of sentences. One sentence. You yeah. know, I love this book. <laughs> Four words. Yeah. Um, Two words. Love liked it or even if you didn't like it but keep a reason why you didn't like it you know on your page. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but please read Imelda's books go and take her courses you know she's got this wonderful online school the pregnant hag you can go you, at the click of a button right now you can go and listen to her introductory webinar it's free it's all about the pregnant hag it's fascinating and it's like a workshop as well because you have to do things there's, there's yes. practical stuff as a oh, yeah. it's really it's it's wonderful and it's a really good introduction to Imelda's style and her teaching and it's it's just lovely Lovely. It's lovely. So I'm a big fan of and your I was Imelda. Students work. Hey? <laughs> My students always 
to work. I don't just lecture. My students are always put to work. You know, they have to get active. Yeah, so and to be work. Warm. Well, that's what teaching is <laughs> about, isn't it? And that, and I think that's what people like. I certainly like it. If I'm if I'm in a workshop or you know, I love to to have something to do. Otherwise, you know, you're all you're doing is is watching a talking head, and you know, yeah. but at it's least you have the slides as well. That's that's good. Um, but anyway, it, it's it's been a joy. It's been a joy talking to you. And, yeah. Um, it's been and, a joy talking to you. Thank you for the insight. No, no, it's been great. And I'll I'll and 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 thank you everybody that's been watching. And um, we'll see you next time on the Witch Wavelength coming soon your way. Sunrise another day, wind blowing freely, spirits of the east I call to you, come and